great to be here with you today um, on this lovely sunny day um, and on um, this day as we continue looking um, at our morning sermon series on the I am sayings of Jesus. If you have a Bible, um, I encourage you to keep it open or to keep it on um, from John chapter 10, as we just had read to us. We'll be looking back through that um, over the coming few moments. Shepherds and sheep. It's not exactly imagery that we are familiar with, particularly here in Stoke Gifford. But in Jesus' day, shepherds and sheep would have been as common as voice scooters, Amazon delivery drivers, and delivery bikes. Perhaps all this talk about shepherds and sheep seems a bit random to us, but not to the people that Jesus was speaking to, to those Pharisees. For them, this wasn't random at all. I wonder how you felt as those first few verses from John chapter 10 were read out. It begins, anyone who doesn't enter by the sheep gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls the sheep by name and leads them out. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. There's a bit of a theme going on here. You get the gist pretty quickly of where Jesus is heading, and it all seems like he's building to a rather big, predictable announcement. But then in verse 7, he makes a rather surprising one. I wonder if you noticed. Verse 7, therefore, Jesus says, after all of that stuff that we just heard, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Sorry, what? I was fully expecting Jesus' next line to be very truly, I tell you, I am the shepherd of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the one who calls and leads this sh these sheep, just like the shepherd that I've just been talking about. This would make sense. But instead, Jesus announces that he is in fact the gate that the sheep walk through. It's unexpected and it is a bit confusing, or at least I found it a bit confusing. It feels a bit like Jesus has got distracted, that he's lost his train of thought, but then he says it again in verse 9. This is no mistake. This is no lapse of logic. Now, of course, if you are familiar at all with this passage, you know that he goes on to say, that he is, in fact, the good shepherd. But that's for next week, and I will not tread on the toes of whoever's giving that message, because that would not be kind or fair. But before he gets there, he clearly wants us to see something else. In saying that he is the gate as well as the shepherd, Jesus clearly wants us to see something more. And so this morning, that is what we're going to be looking at together as we think about Jesus as the gate. Those listening to Jesus that day would have known the scriptures incredibly well. These Pharisees Jesus um, was speaking to spent their lives serving God. They devoted themselves to getting to know God more. They knew the scriptures off by heart. And they would have remembered those times when gates were spoken about. And so when Jesus starts talking about gates... They would have remembered how in Genesis chapter 28, right at the beginning of the story of God's people, Jacob has a dream where he sees a stairway going from earth to heaven with angels ascending and descending upon it. They would have remembered that at the very top of this staircase was the Lord who made some incredible promises to Jacob about his future. And they would have remembered these words that Jacob said when he woke up from his dream. In Genesis 28, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is the gate of heaven. You see, gates are always the meeting point between two places, whether it's a garden gate like this one, 
or the huge gates outside Buckingham Palace that we've been familiar with over the last few days, where people have been waiting to catch a glimpse of the new king. And just as the gates of Buckingham Palace mark a boundary line between where the normal people live and where the royalty reside, so the gate Jacob sees is the meeting point between heaven and earth the dwelling place of man and the dwelling place of God. Now, follow me as I lead us a few hundred years into the Gospel of John, where we have our reading today, just a few chapters before. Stick with me. I promise you're going to be amazed. I was amazed. As I came to read this, I just fell more in love with Jesus as I saw how his word is one big story um, that links together. In John chapter 1, Jesus is having a conversation um, with, about this very event that we just heard in, John chap- in Genesis 28. Philip, who's recently encountered Jesus um, and chosen to follow Jesus, invites his friend Nathaniel to come and find out who this guy Jesus is all about, to come and meet him. And when Jesus sees Nathaniel coming, he says of Nathaniel, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. To which Nathanael replies, how do you know me? Jesus then says something about seeing him under a fig tree um, before Nathanael had even spotted Jesus coming, which clearly um, Nathanael thinks is really quite impressive, this fig tree business, because he then responds and says, surely this is the son of God. You are the king of Israel. But then Jesus basically says, you think that me seeing you under a fig tree before you'd even spotted me is impressive? Well, Nathaniel, you ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen anything. And then in verse 51 of John chapter 1, he says this, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You will see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Does that ring any bells? It certainly would have done for those listening in Jesus' day. He uses this same language of Genesis 28, of the angels ascending and descending, of heaven meeting earth. But now the place this is happening isn't some physical location. It's not the place Jacob was dreaming that day. It is Jesus himself. Jesus is the place where heaven and earth meet. Angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He is the meeting point between heaven and earth. In his dream, Jacob catches a glimpse of the gate of heaven. But here in John 10, Jesus says, I am the gate. It is me. I am the meeting point between heaven and earth. If you want to see glimpses of heaven, you see it through me. And this was a big deal for the Pharisees. For them, the temple was the meeting point between the place God dwelt and where human beings lived. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 the temple isn't it anymore. I am the meeting point. It's not through a location, but a person. I am the gate. Before moving to Bristol, I was a student pastor at a church in the centre of Cambridge. And every week we ran a student night. Um, Around 100 students would come and gather. And as they made their way up to the stairs, um, uh, where we up the stairs to the place where we shared a meal um, each week, I would always be on the door greeting them, saying hi, asking them how their weeks have been. Um, And um, there was one particular student who came up this day and um, he was called Ross. And um, Ross was always super chilled, very easy to talk to. But this particular day, he was incredibly awkward. And he sort of looked at me and said, hi, Ali, like in this really suspicious way. And I wondered what the heck was going on. And then ev- all the students behind me went quiet as they were eating their meals. And there was a lot of whispering and giggling, which <laughs> is enough to make one feel quite uneasy. Um, and anyway, um, it became clear quite quickly 
why Ross and the rest of the students were acting quite so shifty. You see, Ross was on the May Ball Committee for his college. And for those who don't know, as I didn't, prior to becoming the student pastor in Cambridge, a May Ball is a summer ball, which in fact happens in June. And one would have thought that being so clever, these Cambridge students would have got the right name for the month that the ball happened in. But clearly not. This May Ball um, was called a May Ball. It had been for centuries, and it wasn't going to change in Cambridge. Um, but when Ross couldn't cope anymore with the awkwardness of this conversation, the entire room went quiet and he announced that as kind of president of his May Ball committee, he had chosen to set aside a bunch of tickets for me and for my friends so that we could go to the May Ball. And not just that, but he and all of these students had funded my ticket to go to the May Ball. I couldn't believe it. I'd never been to one, having not studied in Cambridge. Um, it's not the kind of thing that anyone can get tickets for. You've got to be invited. And because of Ross's invitation, I was able to go and enjoy the delights of that ball for a few hours. For several hours, we were transported into another world, a world of amazing food and drink, where there was wonderful activities, plenty of things to see and do, beautiful surroundings, stunning outfits. It was so much fun. But you know, without Ross, there was no way I could enter into that place. I couldn't have gone on my own. I was only able to see and experience it through him. And you know, in a similar <laughs> tenuous way, we cannot see heaven without Jesus. We cannot see heaven without Jesus. He is the one who brings heaven to earth. It is through him. Whether that's healing a blind man like we see in John chapter 9 just before our reading today, whether that's calming storms miraculously on Lake Galilee, feeding thousands of people with a child's picnic. Imagine that on the green just now, if the entire thing was um, fed by Joss's picnic. I tell you what, that really would be a miracle. Um, setting people free from evil spirits that were wrecking their lives, even raising the dead to life. He is the one who brings heaven to earth. And because he smashed a hole through death in the resurrection once and for all, the, these heaven meeting earth moments are not just historic. We continue to see them today as Jesus breaks into our everyday lives. And I'm sure that we have stories in this room where we have seen those heaven meeting earth moments here on earth today, when relationships are restored, when people are healed, when people are set free from addiction, when we find ourselves miraculously provided for, when broken lives are transformed and hope is restored. Jesus is the meeting point between heaven and earth. He was then and he is now. And the key to seeing heaven invade earth, God's kingdom established on earth as it is in heaven, is not strategies or leadership manuals or church growth guides. It's not about buildings or equipment or fancy technology, and these things are not necessarily bad. I really want you to hear that. They are good and they help us and aid us in our worship and service of God. But there isn't any point in any of it if we don't have the presence of Jesus. Here at St. Mike's, we are blessed with so much. An amazing space, wonderful facilities, and all of it is such a gift from God. But we know that without the presence of God, it's nothing. It's just another building. The true meeting point between heaven and earth is the presence of Jesus. Only through him do we see glimpses of heaven. So let's keep our eyes on him. Let's keep making him front and center of our lives, our mission and our ministries as we seek to see God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Gates are meeting points. Jesus, the gate is the meeting point between places, between heaven and earth. But just as they are meeting points between places, so too are they meeting points between people, 
Just think of an arrivals gate at an airport. Maybe that familiar scene from Love Actually. Those of us who have seen it, that opening scene, the arrivals gate at Heathrow with the dulcet tones of Hugh Grant um, commentating on what's going on as loved ones are reunited, as relationships are restored. When Jesus says that he is the gate, you see, this is personal. Jesus is the meeting point between people. And at the time Jesus was saying these things, shepherding was a very big deal, as we've already said. And when shepherds led their sheep out into the pastures, there would be these sheepfolds, which you'll see here on the screen. Um, and they were essentially structures which had stone walls all around and then a little gap so that the sheep could get in and out safely. And although there was no physical gate, the shepherd would position themselves in that gap, acting like a gate through which the sheep could come into a place of safety. And for the sheep, safety came when they entered into that sheepfold. But by saying he's the gate, Jesus reminds us that it is through him that we too enter into a place of safety. Except for us, that's not a sheepfold, but relationship with our Heavenly Father. Through Jesus, we enter into the most precious relationship that will ever be offered to us. Back in 2015, I was going through a really tough time. I was anxious, I was fearful, I was worried about what the future would bring. And my vicar at the time said something to me which I have never forgotten. Ellie, no matter what is going on in your life, there is no safer place to be than in relationship with our Heavenly Father. He is absolutely right. He was right then, and, and it still holds true today. It brought me comfort then, and it brings me comfort now. There is no safer place for us to be than in relationship with our Father, with the one who delights in us, the one who loves us and who leads us into life in all its fullness. That's what our passage said. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Gates often shut out like those gates at Buckingham Palace that we've seen. But the Jesus, the gate, he welcomes us in. In the temple was a huge curtain, which was like a gate between heaven and earth. The Holy of Holies, the place where God lived and the place where human lives. And once a year, this high priest would go into that place and would make offerings on behalf of the people. But apart from that, no one else could come in. No one else could enter. The gates were firmly shut. But as Jesus died on the cross on that first Good Friday, that curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And this gate that had shut out for so long was opened wide. Jesus isn't a gate who shuts out. He is a gate who welcomes in. Through Jesus, we can all come, not just once a year, but every single day, every single moment of our lives, we are welcomed in. And perhaps this morning, you've set up camp outside the gates. You've settled for catching a glimpse of the king because you are cautious about entering in. Maybe you fear that your entry into God's kingdom will be met with rejection, with a sense of, you know, you're not worthy. You're not impressive enough. You're not good enough. You've done too much wrong to mean that you can come and see me. But that is not the case. That is so far from the truth. For us, the gate is open and it is meant to be used. If it wasn't, it would be a fence. And as far as I'm aware, I am the fence was not one of the I am sayings of Jesus. In saying he's the gate, Jesus is inviting us in to the safest and most secure place that we could ever find ourselves, relationship with our Heavenly Father. What's holding us back today? What's causing us to set up camp outside the gates? You know, if we'd had a ticket for Westminster Abbey yesterday, I'm pretty sure that we would have gone. 
If we'd been given access into Buckingham Palace to the parties that were going on, I don't think we'd have thought twice about going along. Or maybe we would have done, but I probably wouldn't. <laughs> but through Jesus, we've been given access to a way better party than the one that was going on yesterday. We've been given access to the party of parties, to relationship with a heavenly king who will never fail or forsake us. You are welcome to come in. Or maybe this morning, you know you're welcome. You know that through Jesus, we've been invited into this relationship, but we've lost sight of God's goodness for us. Verse 10, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full, feels a long way from our own experience of the Christian life right now. Maybe we've started looking in other places, turning to other things. Maybe we've never experienced this abundant life that Jesus talks about. Well, today we have an opportunity, wherever we find ourselves, to take God at his word again. I am the gate that leads to abundant life. This morning, we are invited, every single one of us, into that abundance with him. Jesus, the gate, is the meeting point between heaven and earth. It's the meeting point between us and our heavenly Father. And as we join, as we enter into that relationship, we get to join with Jesus in being the meeting point between heaven and earth. How amazing is that? And I finish with this. As we trust and follow Jesus day by day, we are called to be those who bring heaven to earth. But we can't do that in our own strength. This isn't because of who we are or the qualifications we have or how impressive we're feeling or looking. We do it because of his spirit which dwells in us as we choose to follow him. And so maybe this morning, our prayer is that we are filled afresh with this spirit, that we might be those who carry the presence of Jesus, this heaven meeting earth presence into our daily lives. Mm -hmm.